We're just letting people into the Zoom room and we'll get started in a minute. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Rick Hassan of UCLA School of Law and the Safeguarding Democracy Project. And I want to welcome you to the first installment in our spring 2024 webinar series for the Safeguarding Democracy Project. I want to thank Harley Hamm and Ben Austin DeCampo for their important logistical support. And I want to tell you about some upcoming programs of the Safeguarding Democracy Project. All of these programs are free, but registration is required. On Tuesday, February 6th at 12 p.m. Pacific time, we will be holding our next webinar entitled, What Can We Do to Have a Fair and Safe Election in 2024? Speakers will include Renee Duresta of the Stanford Internet Observatory, Kate Klonick of St. John University Law School, Charles Stewart III of MIT, and Kim Wyman of the Bipartisan Policy Center. And I will be moderating that event. On Thursday, February 15th at 7.30 p.m., in conjunction with the UCLA Hammer Museum, I will be speaking with UC Berkeley Dean Erwin Chemerinsky about my upcoming book, A Real Right to Vote. If this event is in person, uh, you can't uh, register in advance for this one, but a recording will be posted after the event. And if you'd like to get that recording, you can go to the Safeguarding Democracy Project website and sign up for our emails. On Thursday, March 14th at 12 p.m. Pacific time, Professor Rick Pildes will moderate a webinar entitled Business's Role in Preventing Democratic Backsliding. The speakers that day are Daniela Ballou Ayers of the Leadership Now Project, Richard Eidlin of Business for America, and Ben Ginsberg of the Hoover Institution at Stanford. And on Tuesday, April 9th at 12.15 p.m., both in person here at UCLA Law School, as well as online, I will be moderating a discussion on race and the risk of election subversion. The speakers will be Matt Barreto of UCLA, Sophia Lynn Lakin of the ACLU and Spencer Overton of George Washington University Law School. Links for all of these events are on the SDP website and all of these events aside from the Hammer event require uh, advanced registration. Uh, they are free, but registration is required. And with that out of the way, today I'm extremely pleased to welcome my old friend, Ryan J. Riley. He is the author of the excellent new book, Sedition Hunters: How January Sixth Broke the January uh, How How January Sixth Broke the Justice System. Ryan is a justice reporter for NBC News. He was a 2017 Livingston Award finalist for his reporting on jails for HuffPost. Uh, probably no one in the country has followed the January Sixth uh, investigations and prosecutions more closely than Ryan has. Uh, near the end of today's program. I will take some of your questions for Ryan. You can use the Q&A box at the bottom of the Zoom uh, platform to submit your questions. And I will try to get to as many of them as I can uh, before we run out of time. Uh, welcome, Ryan. It's great to have you here with us today. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, we go way back. I was, thinking, I was trying to remember how long ago it was, but uh, we first met when you were a reporter for Talking Points Memo. And uh, one one of your beats was the 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 fake voter fraud beat, I, uh, for lack of a better term, um, where lies were told uh, mostly to the Republican base about elections stolen by Democrats. And I thought I'd just open up by asking you to like step back a little bit and think um, historically, how would you describe the evolution of and the weaponization of the voter fraud lie that when it started in you know, in earnest in the early 2000s um, uh, to the point that we got to January 6, 2021 with the storming of the Capitol based on the idea that the election was stolen. Yeah, well, I mean, as you all well know, you know, this really does go back decades. And I write a little bit about, you know, the RNC consent decree looking back at this incident from, you know, the 1980s um, in which, you know, Republicans in New Jersey basically sent out these 
sort of poll watching uh, groups that ended up resulting in this consent decree where Republicans were barred for the RNC specifically was barred from um, sort of sending, you know, make, making it, taking any of these actions which could suppress the vote or were meant to sort of, you know, frighten people basically from going um, to the polls. But, you know, in terms of personally covering it, you know, I, I think we probably started talking probably in, you know, 2010 or something like that. Um, and really, especially going into the 2012 election, um, is what I sort of was really focused on this. Um, but also sort of, I, co I covered a lot of the fallout from an incident which ended up becoming this major sort of cause celeb on uh, on Fox News um, that was started when the day that uh, Barack Obama was elected. Um, and there was an incident in Philadelphia. Uh, it was actually a polling place very close to my so my high school. So I sort of knew the, the area well. Um, and what ended up happening is essentially some um, Republican poll watchers had showed up. There was this video that was filmed um, and a couple of members of the new Black Panther Party um, were there. Um, you know, the, the key thing about this, and one of them was holding a nightstick. Um, and, you know, so there was this dramatic video. This was in, this was sort of before cell phone video was as readily available. So, you know, it was actually someone with an old school camcorder uh, and then, but it was sort of one of these initial um, things that got started up and fun fact, Mike Roman, the person who ran the website that first uh, sort of publicized that video is now of course uh, very much at the center of this and subsequently went on to work for Trump in the White House in both his 2016 campaign and his 2020 campaign and is now charged alongside uh, Trump in Georgia. Um, but that video sort of went really viral and there's a sort of a really big fallout in the first uh, uh, first uh, term of the Obama administration because there was someone within DOJ um, who was sort of hired under um, a conservative activist who was sort of hired into the Civil Rights Division who really made this um, into what it what it became. Um, this ended up being a multi-year scandal, sort of for uh, or you know sort of pseudo scandal, I suppose for um, for the right wing media. Um, but you know what, and I think that that sort of if he's start there, that sort of explains a lot of this, because what a lot of this is all based off of, you know, I think, which I think the media can do a better job of explaining um, and being sort of truthful about is just sort of like pure race, racial politics, right? Like a lot of this really, it, at the at the crux of it, having covered, you know, the Rudy Giuliani um, defamation trial and involving those two Georgia election workers, like at the base, this is really just showing images of black people voting is often what makes uh is often what really generates a lot of this attention and, and scandal and sort of um trying to make some sort of scandal when there's when there's no actual substance there um is is what a lot of this was ultimately about so it has a really i think ugly um history uh within um the republican party and more and more you know especially recently, I think, since the election uh, of Barack Obama, this has been sort of a major, a major focus. I guess another through line from, you know, back in the, the early days, uh, this would go back to the George W. Bush administration uh, to um, uh, today is the weaponization of the Department of Justice, because mm -hmm. the, these voter fraud claims, uh, there was a push to try to have these uh, U.S. attorneys um, uh uh, investigate this, and uh, I'm not, maybe you could tell a little bit of that story and how that connects. Uh, yeah, to, right. Like we, there was a, we had a whole U.S. attorney scandal over this the first time around, you know, which is sort of interesting because there was this big push uh, within the the Bush administration within the White House to sort of turn up evidence of voter fraud. And what's interesting is you talk to some Republican, you know, former Republican U.S. attorneys uh, who sort of ended up getting kicked out because they didn't churn up enough of these cases. Um, and they'll tell you, right, like that there's just not a lot of evidence there because, you know, as you well know, <laughs> having written about this extensively, it's just really, it's not a really, <laughs> stealing elections like individually vote by vote is just a really sort of not, you know, in addition to being difficult, it's just not a smart way to sort of pull this off. It takes this a ton of coordination um, and I don't know, it, it's just, it's very interesting to me that somehow, I think, despite uh, sort of Republican beliefs about, about Democrats and, um, and, you know, government in general, they somehow think that there's just a bunch of super geniuses out there who are all coordinating and leaving no trail whatsoever and pulling off uh, these sort of mass uh, voter fraud efforts when, you know, in reality, I think the, the reality of it is, is that, you know, a turn, a uh, 
depressing turnout uh, at, in these certain places is beneficial to the party. So you can say you're looking at fraud, but in reality, anything you do that has the, um, has the I guess, side effect is a benefit to you, right? So if you're if you're trying to suppress turnout in in certain in certain areas, as Donald Trump would uh, refer to them, you know, bad things happen in Philadelphia. You know, we heard that from him um, during the campaign. That has the benefit of of benefiting um, of benefiting Republicans. Of course, what I always point to, especially you know in Philly, you look in Detroit as well, is that Donald Trump did better in those cities in 2020 than he did in uh, 2016, which sort of just guts it all. Together, it's the suburbs where he lost more uh, more ground, but that's not, of course, their their focus. They're not um, training their you know their focus. We saw this in 2020 with them sort of desperately the Trump campaign desperately trying to find some sort of scandal, even to the point of looking at people who were dropping off two ballots or something, you know, who are, they're a wife and a husband, and the husband would drop off the ballots and uh, at a ballot box, and they would you know sort of try to scandalize that in some way. Um, the lengths they went to, to to try to make just ordinary activity look uh, scary or look like fraud, uh, it really was quite something. But you know, even they don't even they didn't even end up with frankly a lot of anecdotes, which is why covering all of these cases, it's just it's just if you you feel like you're sometimes banging your head up against the wall because you know in court and in these proceedings you have to actually present evidence. Um, and that's why the Trump campaign failed across the board. Um, but there's just this inherent belief within um, a lot of the Republican base and within a lot from a lot of January 6 defendants that somehow uh, the uh, 2020 election was stolen. And, you know, for some of them, they, I think, have seen the light uh, and have really recognized um, what they fell for and sort of have, have openly said in court and told judges that they were duped, they were fooled, that they, you know, I, I'm using their words. A lot of them have said that they, you know, felt like idiots for falling uh, for this. But um, but there's a whole other contingent of people who still, I think, to their last breath, will believe these falsehoods about the election. Yeah, I guess I just see that some of what Trump did would not have been possible in terms of getting people to believe this if we hadn't had that 15, 20 year history of these kind of claims beforehand that he kind of built on those in a way that... Um, didn't require creating something from scratch or a new belief on the part of some people. Completely. I sort of think of that. What was that Obama phrase that became a little bit of a scandal? You didn't build that, right? Yeah. Like, not, like it's sort of the same thing. Like Donald Trump, this wasn't, you know, something he just came up with one day, right? He was feeding into this, this narrative. And it was sort of this feedback loop where these were the, these, these were the conspiracies, conspiracies he was being fed and then he spread them more and it just sort of snowballed. And you saw that, you know, 2016, right? It, it feels like forever ago and we sort of forget about it, but like, and it, it didn't really ultimately matter because Donald Trump won the electoral college vote, but like he formed a whole commission because he his ego couldn't take the fact that he lost the popular vote in 2016, right? So they, um, you know, opened this wide up and remember he was in control of the Justice Department for four years and just really, you know, besides that one, uh, Republican voter scan, uh, voter fraud scandal in North Carolina. I mean, there just wasn't much that they came up with. The cases that they did generate were really just sort of, I mean, really low rung sort of stuff by people who mistakenly thought they were allowed to vote was all the cases that they came up with. This idea that there were millions of illegal votes cast is just completely preposterous, but uh, it continues to be a, a, a belief that is um, strongly held amongst some of his um, strongest borders. Let me turn now to your book. Hold it up here. Obligatory. Buy this book. It's a great book. I was thinking it's really four books in one. Uh, so, I mean, maybe you count it differently, but I, I count four different themes. Uh, one is the story of January 6th itself uh, and the people who were motivated to go there and why they did that. Second, it's the story of the sedition hunters who are in your, um, the title of your book. These are people who are using uh, technology to try to track down January 6th participants to identify them if they haven't been charged yet. Third, you tell the story of some of the intelligence failures uh, to understand, uh, you, know, uh, you know, why didn't, why wasn't there more law enforcement uh, at the Capitol on January 6th? And fourth, you describe the Herculean task facing the DOJ right now and seeking to bring these people to justice for their participation in the attacks before the statute of limitations runs out on their crime. So, uh, it must have been a challenge to pitch this to a 
to a a, um, a book publisher. It's like, uh, you know, I know they like things narrow, but I really appreciated the wide approach. So I want to walk through each of these four things. You, you started to touch on this already, um, but let's go into a little bit more depth about the people who are motivated to go there. Um, who were they? What you know? What was their background? Were these people coming from from rural areas, from cities? Were these rich people? Were they poor people? Were they white? Were they uh, people of color? Like who was in this crowd, and what got them? I mean, it it took a lot to get you. You know, not only you're gonna you know come all the way to Washington D.C., but then to march over the Capitol, and then to actually you know go in there, and with some of them using violent means to get in or to get through. I think it really was a whole range, right? There were very rich people. There were very uh, poor people. There were people who traveled by bus. There were people who traveled uh, by chartered uh, private flight, right? Like th this was sort of the whole um, the whole realm, I think, um, that you saw. Um, I mean, it, overall, it was people who were convinced that the election was stolen. And, you know, I think that that was what was sort of surprising. You know, I, I wrote a lot immediately after the election, about what a threat this was, right? Like that was something that I covered. I talked to uh, FBI informants, even uh, people and folks in law enforcement who were very concerned about this, just because it seemed like a very obvious threat. If you had millions of people who believed in this completely bogus conspiracy theory and thought that America was being swept out from under them, that this was 1776 2.0, um, some of them are going to do something about it. Um, but the, you know, the issue there was is that. It was still sort of, I think, approached by law enforcement from the sort of lone wolf uh, perspective that individuals would um, might act in, in a certain way. And you should, sure you had to watch out for that. But, you know, it was sort of a lot of them filtering through just a tremendous amount of content uh, that was that was coming in. Um, and so I think, you know, with the individuals who went there, it really was just a huge range um, of people who believe that the election was stolen. I think a lot of, there's also some people who were just sort of motivated by um, also some of the, the COVID restrictions, I think motivated a lot of people, but primarily that was sort of the shared thing. So, I mean, while you definitely had these groups like the Oath Keepers and the Proud Boys who were sort of at the tip of the spear in some ways, um, it really was the quote unquote normies as the Proud Boys called them, uh, who were causing the biggest sort of, you know, problem, who were the, the weapon that day, right? Like it, this doesn't succeed if it's just some proud boys who uh, had tried to storm the Capitol. Um, this doesn't succeed if it's just some Oath Keepers. Uh, this succeeds because of the mass of people um, who were assembled there, who um, really did get really riled up. Um, and, you know, we, we see this in sentencing memo after sentencing memo um, from defense, uh, from defendants. It's just like, you know, them getting, they got caught up, right? Caught up is a common phrase we hear. Um, they, you know, got sucked into mob mentality. Um, and it really just became this thing where they, you know, heard this speech, this rah-rah speech, fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore, trial by combat. Um, and then being in this crowd of like-minded people, um, caused some people who, you know, really, in some cases, right, there's some people who have very long criminal histories, so I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush, but there were a lot of people who, given the, the rest of their life trajectory, you would just be really surprised that they would go and commit um, some of the criminal acts that they did because, you know, they were law-abiding citizens. Um, and, you know, it's definitely a mix. There are people who have extensive histories of you know, abusing women of domestic violence of, of, of all sorts of crimes in their past. Uh, but, you know, then you have just like doctors, right? Like that's, that was, it's always the one to me where, you know, it, it always points out to me that people can be intelligent in one very specific way, but, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean they are using their mind and applying reason and logic, um, to areas where they might not have an expertise, um, who, you know, like doctors and people who are very accomplished in other, um, other areas who took part in this. And I mean, the one, there's one that sticks out to me and this happened with, this is sort of a trend uh, with multiple defendants, um, which I can never quite understand where people who are, as they were storming the Capitol believed that they were storming the White House and said that out loud. And there was even a doctor who said that out loud um, that, you know, here we are storming the White House. And you just like think through the, uh, you know, the, the schoolhouse rock logic of that. And Wait, so you thought you were storming Trump's house? It just doesn't quite 
really a computer makes sense, but that's, you know, that's what they were, that's the under, the sort of really baseline understanding that they had is that this is something that they were doing because the election had been stolen. Something you, write, yeah, something you write about, I, I've, I've written about as well in my cheap speech book is this Trump tweet uh, uh, back in December, you know, come, come to the Capitol will be wild. Um, obviously, you know, some of these Proud Boys, uh, Oath Keepers, they were planning for violence and it's well documented in your book. But what did people think or did they think, you know, the, the average person, the one who got caught up in this, what did they think wild was going to be if it was not going to be some kind of attempt at violence to try to stop the counting of the votes. Yeah, I mean, I think that, that I mean, I, I think that a lot of people interpreted that in a way that meant there would be violence, right? And like, that was something that I talked to an FBI informant who, you know, the day that Trump sent that tweet had sent in a report saying the far right is seeing this as a call to arms, um, full stop, right? That's what they, they, they saw this as, this was about violence. Um, and that's what, um, how they interpreted it, right? Like, you know, you, it's sort of in the same category of that stand back and stand by, right? Or the, the thing I always think of is is Trump um, saying, you know, oh, don't be too nice to people when they were, when they, this was earlier in a speech to cops during his presidency, which caused some scandal when he was saying, oh, don't be too nice when you're putting defendants' uh, heads in, into cars, right? Like maybe remove your hand, right? Now he wasn't saying, like, it's it's sort of this way he has of playing around with things because, what he was saying there wasn't an endorse, like he wasn't saying commit a crime. He wasn't saying outright, right? Like, but that's what he was suggesting, right? He was suggesting if you purposely hit someone's head on a car door, car door as, as you have custody of them when they're in handcuffs, I mean, you committed a federal civil rights offense, like full stop, right? That's a federal crime to knock someone's head on a door when they're in custody. Um, and that's what he was encouraging really implicitly, I think, cops to do there. And it's sort of this similar game that he's been playing or, you know, when he talks about um, taking, uh, um, remo removing protesters from his rally when he didn't like them and saying, you know, that was probably more explicit when he said, you all pay your bills, um, you know, to whoever sort of helps get them out of there. So it's, there's been this undercurrent of, of, of violent, of implied violence or, you know, violent rhetoric around a lot of this. And I, you know, Trump has to know that full well. And we've seen that in so many cases where, um, where people who have sort of crossed him have been, have been targeted. Um, and, you know, we've seen a lot of swatting incidents, for example, even aimed at the judge, um, Judge Chuckin in his, uh, in the Jack Smith case, Jack Smith himself. It's just a constant sort of theme of, of, um, you know, potential violence or that he continues to sort of, I think, imply or talk about. It's interesting that uh, you talk about these kind of coded messages. Uh, I don't know if you've had a chance yet to read Trump's brief in the disqualification case currently before the Supreme Court, but uh, his lawyers mock, uh, mock the expert witness who testified, you know, and said, why should you listen to a sociology professor about coded messages? Uh, but of course, it's always been that idea of plausible deniability that, you know, you don't explicitly say come and do violence and then you can say well you know people you know they they read it how they wanted to read it uh, i didn't engage in insurrection i mean and right this is obviously an issue that the supreme court's going to have to address uh, when they they consider trump's disqualification comey has talked about this too in terms of the won't someone rid me of this metal some priest sort of approach that trump uh, trump takes to a lot of this all right so let's turn to the sedition hunters uh the I don't know if you call them the heroes of your book, but uh, some of the main protagonists. Who are these people? What are they doing? And why are they doing it? I mean, they're really from all across the country, um, but it really is really neat how this came together. And this was, you know, on the platform formerly known as Twitter is where a lot of this started to unfold is how people trace these individuals with hashtags, because the way this really all sort of kicked off was there was this really uh, dramatic photo that, the no one actually even knows the origin of it um, today, frankly, because it was sort of in this sort of really chaotic day. But um, it was this photo from above the Lower West Tunnel, uh, which is where most of the violence, took, some of the most extreme violence took place. That's where, you know, Mike Fanone gets dragged out into the mob, as well as some other officers where Fanone had a stun gun um, put into his neck. Um, 
it's um, you know just assault after assault after assault. This was a sustained attack. Um, this was where there just was a ton of violence. And this photo is taken from a level up, like above the tunnel, so it's from overhead. And what you see is an officer face down being dragged down the steps. Um, and what sort of ultimately kicked this? What sort of kicked this off was someone went on Twitter and said, "Okay, let's you know let's ID these people, right?" And they gave them all hashtags. Um, one of them, for example, was an individual who they dubbed Cat Sweat. Um, and that cat was because sweat? he had Cat Sweat. And that was because he had a caterpillar sweatshirt, right? So the nicknames are really important. And I think that that's what sort of differentiates, which I think there's reasons the FBI didn't do this, but those nicknames are super important because, you know, when you're going through, I mean, there are over 3,000 suspects that we're talking about here, right? Now, now we know what the full scope of this was at the time in these early days, they had no idea. Um, the thought was that maybe 800 people entered. Uh, that was way um, south of what the actual number uh, of individuals who could be charged was. But um, they also, you know, labeled them, and it just really sort of sticks in your mind. Oh, right, that guy, cat sweat, right? It's just sort of easy to remember. There's a guy who uh, was dressed in an American flag uh, suit and a uh, an eagle, and when he turned, took off his his eagle. Hat, and when he took off the eagle hat, he was bald underneath. So they called him Bald Eagle, which wasn't necessarily the best uh, hashtag because there are lots of hashtag Bald Eagles, just regular actual photos of Bald Eagles. But it was it was clever, at least, I suppose. Um, and so a lot of these hashtags really became the way that um, these suspects were tracked. And this was a lot of this was really manual in those early days where it was just, OK, every time you found a photo of somebody, you'd add to a hashtag. But, you know, over the course of the next weeks and months in early 2021, um, really, this sort of started started to professionalize. And I think really early on, there was an effort because of how this went south with the Boston Marathon bombing, where people were blamed um, or wrongfully accused of being of being suspects. It was really sort of a mess. There was a message like sort of put out very early from some of uh, from some experts in um, this sort of open source intelligence or OSINT work uh, saying, we don't put names, we don't post names on social media. That's not what we do, right? Like we report names to the FBI, we, we can give names to journalists and work with journalists, but we do not post just post names on social media because that could go south very quickly. Um, and for the most part, I mean, especially now, but you know, for the most part then, people really stuck with that. And that turned out to be a really smart strategy because um, it just, it, it built a lot of trust, I think, in the, in the community. And like, you know, when, when I sort of got sucked into this, I was, I think, because of what happened with the Fox Marathon bombing, because of, I had known how this would work out, it had worked out in the past. And just, you know, as a journalist, you get a bunch of sort of untrue tips, right? At some point, somebody will get something in their head and and spell something out and, and they're just wrong about it. Like even in the January 6th stuff, I got stuff that was like, oh, this person looks like this person. And then you, you know, it takes a little bit, but you report it out and you're like, this is why this is not that person. Um, I remember there was someone who they thought was a mayor in some, I don't know, or mayor council person in some state in California that was incorrect. And, you know, it took me a little bit, but it, was, it, it kind of looked similar. It wasn't unreasonable, but you can sort of suss that out. Um, so I think that, you know, not, Putting those names out there ended up um, being a smart move and allowed some of these things to be vetted, um, and um, I think built also built up some trust with the FBI and with um, with journalists who ended up working um, directly with the Salus in a lot of these cases. And it really just got it was just a really impressive feat. And um, you know, I, I sort of spell out in there, I think, like just how much of a role they're playing now. But that. You know, took a while to sort of build up that trust and for some of these clues to, I think, you know, professionalize or, or formalize their relationships uh, with the FBI. Because, you know, one of the themes I get out here is that the FBI, the Hollywood reputa reputation of the FBI just really isn't the reality. Um, and, you know, I think that one thing that really illustrates it for me that I just I included in the book and I tell people is that I'd been reporting on the FBI for, for years and had always emailed them at, you know, ic.fbi.gov. And I didn't really know what that meant, but I assumed it stood for something cool, like, you know, intelligence community or something like that, or who knew, who knew. And then like when reporting out the book, I actually spoke to someone and was able to report out it stood for internet cafe. Um, and that was how they had their, their email addresses formatted up until a few years ago was internetcafe.fbi.gov because in the early days of the FBI getting email, uh, 
they physically had to go to a internet cafe within the within the field office um, in order to have access to electronic mail. So that was uh, that was I think sort of explains where the FBI uh, was tech wise, and I think they're still um, really playing catch up just because you know the bureaucracy really is a major hurdle here. Yeah, I want to turn to the FBI, um, uh, and I was struck by you know some of the other technological weaknesses that you identify in the book just in terms of like you're right when you said hollywood like you know we we imagine this fbi nerve center where they're using cutting edge technology they're not using computers with windows xp you know yeah. uh, like kind of like how they were running the space shuttle uh yeah. you know off the, off the old technology um uh was the fbi oh. Did they welcome the help of these sedition hunters or did they see them as uh, meddling in into their affairs? I mean, uh, was there some rivalry there? Was there gratitude? What was the relationship? I think it's, you know, it's changed and it's evolved. Um, I definitely think there is some tension. You know, nowadays there definitely is some tension. I wrote about this. I did a, you know, an anniversary story. Um, I mean, there are lots of people in the book who like, I know their names, but you know, especially now, three years in, it doesn't make a ton of sense to just like, absent certain circumstances, just sort of, you know, even if I call them and report this out, like, there are potential consequences to that. So it's something I think very, a lot about in terms of when I'm naming people, because, um, you know, I don't want to put a, create a situation where there's an unnecessary risk to, um, to law enforcement if someone, you know, knows that, you um, they're onto them. Of course, there's, you know, other concerns if they're a public figure, but, you know, you sort of have to balance all of that out. Uh, but, you know, I think that the tension as it exists today is just sort of a little bit of frustration from the sleuths because there are just so many names in the hands of the FBI and they know like hundreds of people who have been identified and many of them are for really violent, despicable crimes that were caught on videotape and they don't understand. And those are the ones that, um, you know, they're, they're, it's tough to decipher what's going on within the FBI in a lot of those cases. And frankly, you know, I know this because of talking to people um, who are in a position to know it's, there are pockets of resistance within the FBI, even for these really violent um, cases. Just this week, there was someone um, who was arrested for attacking law enforcement officers with a um, baton. Um, and, um, you know, that was someone who was arrested in Louisiana, but that arrest warrant took four months, more than four months to actually be executed. So a judge signed off on that arrest warrant on September 5th, and he was only picked up on Monday, right? So that's more than four and a half months. And, um, you know, it's it, it's tough to report out those things because it, it's, it's not something that the FBI will talk about, um, but, you know, that's definitely been a hurdle. And I think the, we know that we have these quote unquote whistleblowers uh, from the FBI have come forward. Um, and spoken about their opposition to a lot of these January 6th cases altogether, some of whom have been, you know, now indulged in conspiracy theories about January 6th itself, um, even though, you know, it's unclear, I think, if they actually fully buy them, but they're certainly pretending at least to uh, believe them or, or at least act like they're open to the possibility that this was all some sort of FBI setup, um, even though I think they know better. Um, but that, you know, that's the sort of, era that we're in, I think a lot of, there were a lot of technical uh, limitations within the FBI, but there's also a lot of, I think, political resistance. And some of that wasn't just purely political, I would say, like there was just kind of a, an FBI thought that, you know, we don't do misdemeanors, right? That's not often what they're, they're focused on. Um, but the problem with that is, is that the FBI is the only the FBI and federal law enforcement are the only people who have jurisdiction over this, right? This was an attack on the Capitol. Like there are so many things that make this just purely like within the scope of the FBI's job because it's an attack on the Capitol. And also like, you know, you even look at the geofence warrant, for example, the geofence uh, that they drew around, it's just like perfectly set up for this scenario in which like there really aren't the same sort of civil liberties objections that you would have had this happen on a street, right? Like anybody who was inside the Capitol who didn't have permission to be there, it's a pretty, it's like if you draw those bounds, it's tough, I think, even for, you know, some civil liberties folks to come up with uh, objections to those when there's just no 
white basis for someone to have been in a narrowly defined area, right? So those are the things that um, that have led to their, you know, these cases continuing. Um, but it's it, it is tough to sort of figure out what's happening with some of these cases. But the statute of limitations is ticking. We've got less than there are less than two years left uh, for them to bring all of these cases. Um, there are some good questions already in the Q and A. Uh, I'll be getting to them in a few minutes. Um, I want to talk about two more things first, though. One is about the intelligence failures before January sixth, and also about how DOJ is performing now. Um, so first on the intelligence failures, what does your reporting show about why uh, things were not um, uh, well protected? Uh, you know, was this um, a failure of will? Was it a failure of leadership? Uh, you know, we heard um, Trump in a recent speech, he, he, he called uh, Nancy Pelosi, Nikki Haley, you know, and people were talking about how that, you know, maybe shows him slipping, but the fact that he's blaming Nancy Pelosi for this, as opposed to, you know, putting the blame on, uh, you know, his own uh, control of the D.C. Uh, uh, National Guard or, or something else. Where did the fault lie for all of this? You know, this is something that I wasn't expecting when I first sort of pitched this book to end up spending as much time on because I had anticipated that the January 6th committee would have answered a lot more of these questions. Um, but ultimately, I did end up focusing a lot on that because I think the January 6th committee made sort of a political choice to really target Trump and they left a ton of material um, on the ground. And, you know, a lot of my reporting in the book is based off of uh, these FOIAs that were sent in, these um, Freedom of Information Act requests to the FBI and reading through thousands of pages of emails, as well as the sprawl material that was uh, provided by the January 6th committee, even though they didn't really end up distilling that, I think, into um, a finished product, at least in terms of the FBI failures. But I think it's such a critical part of this story because, you know, I think that the reason that we're seeing so many conspiracy theories about the FBI that's being an FBI setup and so many sort of ludicrous uh, proposals is because, again, it's just sort of overestimation of, of federal bureaucracies and um, overestimation of the capabilities of the FBI that is, I really think, really influenced by by Hollywood and by, um, you know, just a lot of uh, a lot of the, the, uh, the material that, you know, but, when Hoover set up this tremendous public relations um, uh, effort when he started the FBI, that the, con the consequences and the impact of that are obviously still being um, seen today, in which you know the FBI is thought to be just light years ahead of everyone else, even though that's not really the case. Um, and I think that there's just this assumption uh, that the FBI. Uh, so even setting aside whether or not they would, would they would do that, like it's just. It, just comes down to this idea of like, that's crazy. They couldn't pull that off if they wanted to. Um, so I think that sort of, you know, popping that balloon is is really important um, and just illustrating the reality of what the FBI was doing. Um, you know, one thing that I just you sort of have to process is think about, right, we're now a little bit into January, but think like when you're just coming back from sort of the, the holiday break, when everyone's sort of, you know, phoning it in for those last few weeks around Christmas and New Year's, like that actually has a big impact there, um, right? You're talking about uh, federal employees at the end of the you know coronavirus year um, after the election, like just what a stressful year. Um, and then there's a bomb that goes off in Nashville and sucks a bunch of resources uh, over to Nashville and everyone's distracted by that. And also, oh, Donald Trump is like maybe gonna fire the attorney general. So that's a little bit of distraction happening too. And then, you know, you come back on what January, you know, January 6th was a Wednesday. Uh, so then you're talking, you know, January 5th, January 4th. So January 4th is really when everyone's showing up for work after the holidays. And like, that's not enough time to prepare for all this. Oh, and also the contract, because someone in the procurement office uh, put uh, this social media monitoring tool uh, up for a bid and so they, the current company got underbid. Now turns out, oh, happy new year. We're switching over to this new provider. Oh, we don't have the logins for that yet. All of our systems are set up here. It's just sort of this catastrophe of bureaucracy and errors. Um, and also I think, you know, an underestimation of, of the threat. Um, I also think that there a component of this is just people not uh, wanting to sort of put their heads uh, on the shopping block because, you know, who wants to write that memo being like, hey, the president's rally is a national security threat, right? Nobody wants to do that. Uh, Chris Ray at the moment, you know, the attorney general just got kicked out. So, you know, it's sort of like, okay, keep your head down. Let's get through this. Let's just get to inauguration day, I think was the over 
overarching theme of this. Um, no one, um, you know, basically just trying to think that, you know, the system would hold, everything would be okay. Um, and then we could all take a deep breath on, on January 20th, which is when they were sort of focused on and more worried about like violence on January 20th rather than, um, than January 6th. So I think, you know, not really putting this into a digestible format, um, the threats that they were seeing out of January 6th was a big part of it. But a lot of this was just like simple bureaucracy um, and just, you know, a, a really fragmented organization um, having trouble bringing something together uh, over the holidays when there were, was this sort of overall attitude of just keep mom, get through this. We got a couple more weeks and then, you know, and then Joe Biden will be president. That's sort of, I think, what they what they thought of this as. So uh, before I turn to questions, the last uh, question for you from me, which is, uh, what grade would you give DOJ in terms of how it's been prosecuting so far and what? I mean, they have had some major wins. You cannot take that away from them, right? Like more seditious conspiracy convictions than, you know, who knows when, right? Like the last time they had a seditious conspiracy trial failed miserably. Um, and that was, you know, a decade ago, even this century, really, there's only been like one other case and that wasn't even the top um, charge here. So like they've, you know, blown them out of the park um, in terms of like seditious conspiracy convictions. But, you know, I mean, I think there will be a lot of historians who go back and look at the timeline on um, the Jack Smith case and wonder if that could have been brought a year earlier before he was appointed as a uh, special counsel, um, if there had been a little bit more um, speed there, because obviously now, like, if this is just a clock, like, this is just a ticking time bomb, and, like, any, like, the whole game, the whole game is really just the clock. It's just clock management, purely at this point, I think, in terms of the DC case, like, you know, I don't even think it's that subtle what they're trying to do, which is to run this out and, um, and kick it as far down the road as they possibly can and gum up the works, because I think that they, uh, believe that their client has a very strong um, chance of being convicted, particularly in um, in D.C., if you believe what they've said publicly. Um, so I think that's something that they'll look at. I don't know if I want to give it a great. I mean, they've I think the problem is, is that now, like, it's just a matter of prioritization and um, bringing, you know, as many of these serious cases as they can before the statute of limitations expires, because, you know, there are cases that they, I think they, you know, are sort of already in the works, but then also become political targets because um, they're, you know, less serious offenses, they're, you know, misdemeanors, um, and there's this, um, you know, certainly desire to um, make this, you know, appear to be overreach uh, by, um, by the feds here. And so, you know, I think for the next year and 11 months uh, is really when this will be decided. But of course, you know, there's also the question of whether or not it is going to be a full year in 11 months, because, you know, it could just as well be just over a year before all of these cases um, are potentially just, you know, stopped by a, a Trump, um, a Trump Justice Department um, and where this all comes to an end and where it becomes um, an investigate the investigator sort of thing, as we already saw with the January 6th um, committee. And, you know, I think what's most disturbing to me is just to see so many people who fell for the lies about 2020, the 2020 election, um, be misled and, and believe a lot of the um, sort of ludicrous lies that are coming from um, the far right um, and even members of Congress uh, about what happened on 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 January, uh, on January 6th. Um, so, I think TBD is, is, what I would, is what I would say. Uh, and the grade is an incomplete. Incomplete, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> the semester isn't over yet. Okay. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, you mentioned the possibility of uh, a, a second Trump uh, administration stopping the prosecutions is also the possibility of pardons. Uh, not to mention self-pardons, self but pardons for sure. Um, yep. All right, let me turn to the questions before we run out of time. Um how concerned are you looking forward uh, about mob violence like January 6th occurring again during or after the 2024 election? So what's on the horizon, either from your FBI sources or, or otherwise? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think the sleuths that I talked to almost think there's been sort of um, 
there's so much worry about federal infiltration. Like there's this, this, this myth of this Hollywood myth of the FBI is also kind of benefited uh, the FBI in some ways because everyone, you know, it's like that Spider-Man meme or whatever, right? Everyone thinks that everyone else is a, is a Fed. There's this constant thing, who's a Fed? Everyone's a Fed. And like just mass events, they're very suspicious of. So even when you've seen like rallies in support of January 6th defendants, they think like, oh, this is all set up, um, yada, yada, you know, everyone's a Fed everywhere. Um, so there's like almost like kind of like a depression of some of these more public events. But, you know, I think that the president, the former president still has the ability to organize uh, and direct um, mob violence um, in uh, a certain way. Um, you know, one of the people we identified in the, in the book and the book was, you know, trying to think when the arrest took place, the book was, you know, almost locked down. I think I ended up having it in the, in the update at the end, but um, someone who we had identified Taylor Toronto uh, as this individual who's from Washington state went inside, he had this sort of weaponized cane and then ended up spending a lot of time hanging out with the J uh, Sixers by uh, the, the J six community by the, uh, the DC jail or the gulag as they, as they call it. And he was so sort of extreme that, and thought that like, you know, Ashley Babbitt's an actor thought all of these conspiracy theories that were too far out for these conspiracy theorists. And he was sort of isolated from, um, that group. And then, you know, one day Donald Trump uh, posted a true social that included Obama's address in, um, in DC. And lo and behold, uh, he shows up to that address um, and starts running around the forest looking for tunnels uh, to get into Obama's home. And there's a gun and ammunition in his, the van that he was living out. Um, so, I mean, there's the lone wolf sort of factor and the, the, but there's all, I mean, I think that the bigger threat um, is more of the mob violence. I think, you know, January 6th, it's a, it's a sort of an open question. It depends if it's organized around. I don't think there is actually as much hope because of actually turn, overturning anything, because obviously we've had legislation that has, you know, been passed, um, which might um, make it less of sort of this, this date. But I certainly think that just this belief and mistrust in election results in general is going to have some really long-term consequences um, and short-term consequences uh, for the country, um, just with the extreme mistrust that we see um, in uh, election systems. And it's it's just hard to imagine a scenario in which Donald Trump um, concedes uh, defeat. So what does that mean? What is he going to do this time? Um, and I also think there's a very, you know, a very significant chance, certainly the polls show that Donald Trump um, could win. So I, I don't know, <laughs> is, the, is the question. I think that the that world is sort of still being shaped. Sure. And if Donald Trump does win, then uh, the possibility of violence in protest of that win or in protest of what he might be doing in terms of immigration or in terms of um, yeah. sending troops into cities under the Insurrection Act. I mean, there's a whole other potential cycle for violence that um, comes on the other on the other side if um, if there is a second Trump term. Um, yeah. You mentioned this kind of a, uh, this idea, you know, everybody's uh, a Fed, you know, everybody is undercover. Um, uh, I guess this goes to another question that someone asked, uh, this broader question about deterrence, right? When we think about deterrence in the criminal justice system, we think about both specific deterrence. You're stopping this particular person from uh, committing a crime again by, you know, the, the threat of punishment or, or actual punishment and general deterrence is deterring others. Um, do you think these prosecutions have emboldened people or do you think that they have chastened people? I think they've, I think they've definitely had an impact in terms of chastening people, although I think they've also sort of radicalized some people in some ways. Um, you know, I, I go back and forth because I don't like the idea of federal courts being turned into a sort of circus atmosphere with like, you know, and but I do think like there are so many moments where I've been sitting in court and watching sort of like tearful apologies. And I'm like, I just wish this this could be captured because it has so much of a, you know, an impact. Like I think the Jenna um, Ellis, you know, video where she's tearfully apologizing um, as she pleads guilty uh, to a crime in Georgia um, had an impact. Right. Like and I think that those things can have impacts more broadly. Um, and, you know, people who recognize especially that they've been. Um, they've been tricked, they've been fooled at the same time, you know, had that been televised in other ways, then people would turn that into more of a rallying cry. So it, it's a double-edged sword. Um, you know, we certainly saw someone the way I sort of end the book, spoiler alert, is with a guy who 
uh, we identified uh, Danny Rodriguez, who drove the stun gun into Mike Fanon's neck. And, you know, he does this sort of checks all the boxes kind of during this rambling speech before the judge. And, you know, he gets sentenced to 12 and a half years in federal prison. Um, and then on the way out after the judge had left the court, sort of like raises his fist and says Trump won. Um, so there's also the threat of that sort of being used to, to radicalize um, more people because, you know, you, you do have a situation now where it's not as, 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 as it used to be earlier, but there are a lot of like-minded people all housed together. Um, and it sort of does become this sort of snowball effect where they, you know, radicalize even more, right? And like, yeah, oh, right. Then they talk to each other and then there's this whole broader um, support community. Um, but, you know, I just, I mean, the real issue is, is that you have just have millions of people who believe something that's fundamentally false and that's um, not great for democracy altogether. There are a few questions about asking more about um, resistance within the FBI and the law enforcement community. Um, why the resistance? How widespread is it? Uh, is it something to worry about? Yeah, you know, it's tough to quantify, um, but it's definitely something that I hear a lot about uh, from um, my sources. And I think actually some of the SLUs are engaged in a project right now where they're tr they are trying to quantify it. And they're looking at like, okay, where do we have the most cases that are being jammed up in the works? Um, and I think that's probably how we're going to get the best representation of that. Cause it's not like, you know, you're talking about so many field offices. I can't just like cold call and like to try to talk to some random uh, FBI guy about, Hey, what's going on with, uh, with this case? But it's something I do hear when I'm, I'm talking to people uh, that there are just these sort of, you know, there are just places where the works are being gummed up. Um, Oregon is something that, that pops to mind. The Portland field office there is something a lot of SLUs are concerned about because there's just so many cases that are sitting there that they don't understand why it hasn't been brought forward. And there is this sort of resistance uh, with a lot of field offices not. And I can say, you know, a lot of the former FBI quote unquote whistleblowers have talked about this and like basically just getting things handed down from DC that then they were supposed to act on. And um, one of the guys, Kyle Serafin, who now has his own sort of podcast uh, and has, has turned himself into sort of a right wing um, podcaster has talked about how, you know, what he would do with those tips or like he would just, you know, trash them essentially, right? He'd say, nope, no further action. Um, or he would talk about, you know, if he, he sort of talked about this theoretically, but he would say that he would go, you know, he would go to, um, to the home of the suspect and like shake his head no as he say, hey, do you want to talk to us? Right. And just any way to sort of, sort of I mean, half ass these investigations. I think is something um, that you know is is something that they've considered uh, in certain parts of the FBI. Um, and there's people who you know just don't politically agree with this. There also like right there was a former FBI supervisor. This is sort of illustrative. First of all, there was an email after uh, after January 6 to the now number two within the FBI from someone who clearly had worked at the FBI who was speaking to other people. Uh, saying, hey, I think like there's this is a real threat. A lot of people are sympathetic. There's also people who were in the FBI who went to uh, or former officials who went to and are, have now been charged in connection uh, with January 6th, specifically a supervisory uh, former special agent who worked in the New York field office in the counterterrorism um, section on the Joint Terrorism Task Force, who, uh, according to the feds, um, encouraged other members of the mobs to mob to kill officers that day. So he goes into the Capitol, comes out, and on video saying, kill him, kill him, as the mob uh, is sort of fighting with officers that day. Um, call, I think we've called them you know, Nazis as well. So um, there's definitely a political contingent within the FBI that is not thrilled about the way that this is uh, being pursued or say, hey, what about, what are, you know, the what aboutism is often what we see. So let me just end by asking you this very broad question. Maybe it's like give, asking you to give a grade to the DOJ, but uh, do you think our democracy is uh, stronger now than it was uh, in the aftermath of the 2020 election? Or do you think that um, uh, things have deteriorated? I mean, where, where, would you, where would you put things um, uh, in terms of where things are on the ground today? I mean, I think there was more of a shared reality immediately after January 6th. Um, and that's definitely been a huge backslide. Uh, there was a shared reality that this was bad. Um, and that, you know, what we saw was what happened. <laughs> that Donald Trump got a bunch of people 
thinking the election was stolen and inevitably some of them did something um, because they thought the election was stolen. Um, and now that's just not sort of where we are. Um, and we, you look at some of the polling about, you know, even just people who think that Joe Biden isn't legitimately elected, um, isn't a legitimate president, it's really significant in some of those, that polling. So I think that that's not a great place to be in. And, you know, it's above my pay grade to figure out how to fix that. I think that, you know, my, I sort of see my role as a journalist is just continuing to like tell the truth about what happened and uh, to shut down, especially, I think, you know, a lot of these crazy conspiracy theories that are coming out about January 6th. Um, that's something that I'm, I'm going to be dogged about you know, when I see these, these rise up. Cause you know, frankly, I think it's the same thing that you saw about 2020, Oh, about the 2020 election, as we see about January 6th now, is it's like people who know better, right? Like it's people who are pretending to be less intelligent uh, than they actually are, um, saying things they don't actually believe. Um, so I think that pressing them on that and getting specifics whenever you can uh, is really important. It's still, you know, if I ever see Representative Stefanik in, in the hallways of Congress, I'm going to be asking her for the names of people that uh, she thinks are uh, political, quote unquote, you know, hostages, uh, because she's not going to want to get, probably she doesn't know any names to start with, but she's also not going to want to get any, any specifics, because if you start talking about specifics, it's a really bad look, politically, uh, because anyone who's being held is, you know, is there because they either committed a crime and were convicted of that crime, um, or because a judge independently looked at the evidence against them, saw that it was overwhelming, found that they were a flight risk, or found that they were a safety risk, a threat to the public, um, or someone who, you know, on the lower end, just repeatedly disobeyed officers and harassed, you know, the, the, there's one individual who was convicted, uh, who has since been convicted, but like, you know, was just harassing his probation officer's mother and calling up like all sorts of harassing phone calls. who was just completely disobeying the justice system or thought they were a sovereign citizen. Um, so that's like the reality. And I think that complete, com continuing to remind people of the reality of that day um, is sort of what I see my, my role as, um, you know, in the years ahead. Well, you've done a great job of reminding us the reality in this book, Sedition Hunters, Ryan J. Riley. Thank you so much for joining us. A uh, reminder, you can find our other programs at safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. Really appreciate the conversation. Thanks so much for having me. Take care, everyone. We'll see you back here in a few weeks uh, with a panel of experts on what will it take to have a fair and safe election in 2024. Bye.